Harold Salente is director of the Trends Research Institute. His team produces the Trends Journal, slam-packed with must-read information. Welcome back, Gerald Salente. Well, thanks for having me back, Chris. You know, Zeke West sent over a copy of your latest Trends Journal, as I mentioned here. I'm going to put it euphemistically, alarming trends here that everyone needs to be aware of. Overriding theme in your journal seems to be war. And you know, our top guests on this show have recently all been alluding to the threat of just that beginning no later than perhaps the end of this year or 2015. Tell us your thoughts here, please. It's hard to say when and how, but the why is pretty clear. And the why is something I've been writing about for years when the panic of 08 began. I said there would never be a recovery, there'd be a cover-up. And they would cover it up with schemes undreamed of. And those schemes undreamed of were record low interest rates like we've never seen in our lifetime. Those schemes undreamed of were quantitative easing, not only in the United States. They have their own version in China and the European Central Bank as well. And then I said, when all else fails, they take you to war. It's a repeat of history. It never repeats itself exactly the same. But you have depressions, and then you have trade wars and currency wars, and then world wars. And in between that, you have a lot of regional uh, scrimmages and civil wars. And that's what you're seeing breaking out now. In our global nomics section of the Trends Journal, we show the hot spots around the world. And they're all identified for everyone that wants to see them. And then what we did was we took the four corners of the world and we showed how it's all being waged around all of this some of it making news and some of it not. And so, of course, one of the ones was Ukraine. Another one we picked was Thailand. Hey, they had a military coup there, son of a gun. How do we know that was going to happen? Well, we've been watching it for several months now, and we wrote several months ago when it began that there'd be a military coup followed by a civil war. And then we wrote about Venezuela. Oh, today news came out. Venezuela said that the United States has a plot to assassinate the president. And they have demonstrations going on there quite frequently. And they're running an inflation rate, I believe it's about 30-something percent. And then you look, the other one we picked was Nigeria. Wow, and that was long before the girls, the missing girls, the 300 or so girls that have been making the news. Why did we pick Nigeria? Well, because in Africa you have a lot of destabilization, a former colony of the European colony that was turned over again to a bunch of gangsters. They call themselves prime ministers or whatever, and kings and this and that. And they have 174 million people sitting on a lot of oil, and 40% of the people are making under a dollar a day. And so you could call them radical Islamists, you call them anything you want that are fighting against the corrupt government, but very easy to see. And then, of course, you start putting the pieces together. Thailand, Ukraine, Nigeria, Venezuela, Yemen, Somalia. You keep going around, Syria. And you can see it's a world in the throes of war, but that's not all of it. It's also the demonstrations that are going on in Italy and in Greece and in Spain and in Portugal that don't make the news here. Hey, did they find that airplane yet? You know, that one that they heard the pinger again for the hundredth time that CNN's been covering as a feature story even this week. So people don't see the dangers of what's going on. And as we tie it all together, Chris... We keep ending the story with, when people lose everything and have nothing left to lose, they lose it. And the other one is, far too few have much too much, and way too many have far too little. And that's what you're seeing going on around the world. They could call it anything they want, terrorism, fundamentalism. It it's, all comes down to the bottom line, and the bottom line is, 
you got a lot of people out of work with nothing to lose, and they're losing it. People want answers. They want to know what is at the root of this. I mean, on one hand, you say, well, you know, morally, we've become bankrupt. Uh, we're not based in the traditions of the past. On the other hand, we have folks who point to economics. As soon as you let the monetary, the the Keynesian genie out of the bottle, all of your money becomes debased. It is the first time in history that there hasn't been a single global currency backed by anything of substance. And eventually that erodes all the confidence and a few elite people at the top of the pyramid wind up with all the change and the rest of us we're left holding the mortgages <laughs> and the paper is that how we got here or is that an oversimplification no it's not an oversimplification but it's part of it because then you have in other countries where that's not the issue so it could be egypt it could be colombia it could be venezuela or argentina so you have corruption to me morals you know i have to say it's the issue because it also gravitates to other levels. For example, back here in the States, President Obama just announced $5 billion for an anti-terrorism partnership with our allies. Oh, $5 billion. I read the same day, they're going to take down 40,000, that's right, 40,000 structures old factories and houses in Detroit. They're going to destroy them. Just take a look at Detroit from any angle. You know, one worries if it isn't the Petri dish representing the rest of the nation here. That's what I'm saying. Now, why is Detroit, what has happened to Detroit? You can't blame it on one thing or one person. It's a combination of unions and a combination of selling out our manufacturing, which they continue to do under the guise of NAFTA and the World Trade Organization that allows companies to get products made in slave labor companies, mark up the prices and bring them back home and resell them. And labor unions with these ridiculous, ridiculous things that they had with, with the auto industry and, and producing inferior cars. Hey, did you get your General Motors car recalled yet? I mean, look what's going on. And then the other point of this is the military. I don't support the troops. I want to make that clear. I am an American patriot. I'm here in Colonial Kingston, New York. I support a national defense force, not foreign entanglements. I do not support troops going to Afghanistan, to Yemen. Now they're sending them into Chad, into Nigeria. I don't approve of them going to Iraq. I don't approve of them going to Syria. I want a defense force. I am an American that stands on the principles upon which this nation was founded. No foreign entanglements. No foreign entanglements. They were going on back then. It was a hundred years war, this war, that war, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Adams, Franklin, all of the founding fathers, no foreign entanglements. So when you want to talk about the other part of this, Chris, listen to the words of General Dwight D. Eisenhower, five-star general, supreme commander of the Allied forces in World War II, and, for the record, a two-term president. He warns the nation that the military-industrial complex is robbing the nation of the genius of the scientists, the sweat of the laborers, and the future of the children. How much more proof do people need? When you look at the defense budget with NAS, NSA watching us, CIA listening to us, FBI tracking us, and you put it all together, you're at over, well over a trillion dollars a year getting flushed down the toilet. As, as Major General Smedley Butler, the most direct, uh, decorated man in American history before his death, warned, I'm... Um, he said that war is a racket, and that's what it's become. So we could look at the other issues, the economic issues, 
But we have to look at what's happened to this nation. Look at the scandal going on now with the Veterans Administration. They use these poor people for cannon fodder. Then they bring them back and they screw them. How much more does this? And look at the size of the budget for the for the for the VA. Look what we're doing to our soldiers, bringing them into foreign countries, into losing wars, coming back either in a casket or without arms, legs, or a mind. If you bring this topic up to people, it becomes emotionally charged. On the one hand, if we pull out of these countries, there's going to be nothing but worldwide global chaos, and that's going to come back. There's going to be blowback. Well, let's stop at that. Let's just stop at that and answer that question. Look what they did in Iraq. We're not there anymore. Wait, pick up the paper every day. Go to antiwar.com. Look at the numbers. 104 dead, 97 dead, 220 dead, day after day. You want to talk about chaos? What did the United States do by going in there? Destabilize the area. Chaos? Hey, all of you people that want to answer the question, try this one on for size. Does Libya fit you well? You remember that humanitarian mission? Or to use the language from the White House, time-limited, scope-limited, kinetic action? Oh, yeah, you want to talk about destabilization since they overthrew Gaddafi? Hey, you want to know why there's problems in Mali? Want to know why there's problems in Nigeria? Want to know why there's problems in Sudan? Want to know why all of those weapons that are now going into Syria, into the hands, and they're not only Islamic radicals. There are thousands of mafia groups that want a piece of the action that have grabbed a hold of the situation in the midst of the chaos. Look, you can't go to Libya now. They're closing down the embassies and telling the people to come home. You could go there on the Gaddafi. He wasn't bothering anybody. Really what I wanted to touch on here, though, was I'd like to examine just what would happen if we decided to bring our troops home. I mean, there's something like, at last check, well over 100 military bases. 700. 700 military bases. And we're not talking little, uh, you know, McDonald's or Wendy's restaurants here. This takes a huge, vast network of, of wealth and resources that the taxpayer has to pay. But let's step back for a minute and let's pull our troops out, close down the 700 bases. Well, we're going to cause massive unemployment in the United States if we do that. Really? Are you so sure of that? What would start to happen over time? You know, would we suddenly have more folks at home to build up our economy who would also be better educated and and have entrepreneurial ideas of their own? And would we not have a sea change of improved sentiment towards the United States from the rest of the world who says, hey, maybe these guys aren't a bunch of militaristic, bombastic monsters after all? Yeah, I think you wrapped it up well, and I agree with you. One of the movements I'm starting, by the way, and it's in the Trends Journal, it's called Occupy Peace. And I want to make this clear. If anybody's ever watched my videos, you know, I do trends in the news each night, each weekday night, and they're on YouTube. We paste them up there. I'm a close combat practitioner. I'm not a pacifist. And I I don't, I don't, you know, I, I don't start trouble, and I don't look for trouble. If somebody tries to attack me, I'll do what I have to do. It's common sense. I mean, everybody's read Sun Tzu. I mean, what is it, 70 pages long? If you haven't read Sun Tzu, you can't be an investor. And you certainly can't be in business because, I mean, it's it's the basics of business. And, and you summed it up perfectly. I mean, he makes it very, very, very clear. You never go to war unless victory is assured and it's absolutely necessary. And so here's what I'm coming up with. It's called OccupyPeace.us. Anybody could go to the website and sign up. We're just putting it in order now. But the site is up. And the purpose of this is it's based on three words. No foreign entanglements. Rebuild America. So now we close down all these bases. We bring the troops home. And now we close down our borders. I'm not, I'm not xenophobic. I'm just non-interventionist. I'm not an isolationist. I travel the world. I believe in, you know, doing business with ever who you want to do business with. But I also believe we have too many people in this country, and we can't take care of our own right now, and we don't need any more. And all they're doing is, is driving down the wages by bringing in cheap labor, whether it's in the tech industry with their H-1B visas or bringing in other cheap labor. 
And when you look at the history of this country during the Depression, up until well after World War II, the borders were closed. Very few were allowed to come in. We need to rebuild America. I don't want my money going to Israel. I don't want it going to Italy. And I'm of Italian descent. I don't want it going to Ireland. And I love Irish women. I don't want it going to Ukraine. I don't want it going anywhere. I want it going to America and Americans. I want it going to Camden. I want it going to Detroit. Look at, look at our Internet system. It is third world. Do you know we rank, we rank right near the bottom when it comes to Internet service? Yeah. Foreigners, and we're the people that brought it to the, to the forefront. And now, look at our... Tra- you travel the world, you come back to JFK. You, where, where, am I, where do I land in Bangladesh? When you go to the other airports? Look at our rail system. It's a disgrace. No, the infrastructure is crumbling. And, and once again, you know, this is because, first of all, we've been misled by a media that is controlled by a few elite, okay? I mean, they have just bought up the media. Media oligarchy. When people get misled and they forget the important functions, they focus on these entanglements instead of focusing on the important aspects of society, like the infrastructure. I mean, look at what we did before the World Wars. I mean, we had a Great Depression. What did we do? We're going to pull ourselves out of this Great Depression by building dams, by building bridges, by building interstate highways. Well, China is doing that right now. They are the quintessential Americans. Do you know, I, I read in the Financial Times, I can't verify it, you know, and you know my motto, I always, always want to say this, I don't care if people agree or disagree with me. The motto of the Trends Journal is think for yourself. These are the facts that we have, this is the way we see it, you use your own brain and you decide. So I read an article about two weeks ago in the Financial Times, and they had said that in two years, between 2010 and 2012, China used more cement to build infrastructure and real estate than the United States used in the entire 20th century. There's an interesting offshoot to this discussion. Shouldn't, I think, just be passed over with complacency. It's the largest producer of the yellow metal of gold worldwide. But what people may not be aware of is that they consumed, they imported the entire global output of gold last year. They don't export any gold on top of that. If they know something that we don't know, and they're certainly importing so much gold, are they preparing for a currency implosion? I think that most intelligent people know that the currencies are backed by nothing and that we've had record low interest rates and there's going to be a financial panic of sorts when interest rates go up and the economies go down. The only thing, look, the, num- the GDP numbers came up out for the last quarter, and they were in the negative territory. And you could blame it on the weather. And well, you should. It's, this is the worst winter back east that I've ever remembered in my life, and I'm no kid. But when you look at Europe, when you look at China, you have the Chinese housing market this year is down some 24%. There's no recovery in Europe. You look at the OECD uh, forecast coming out, and, and they're showing negative growth. So even if the, the economy ticks up a little bit in the states on GDP growth, What's going to sustain it? Nothing. So what they're doing is they've debased the dollar by printing so many of them 
and, and at record levels we've never seen before with interest rates at all-time lows for never, never, never in the history of the country for this long. It's unprecedented. Are you aware that there are more dollars circulating outside of our shores than within our shores, which I think is an incredible vulnerability should the world suddenly lose confidence, they seem to be doing every day in the U.S. dollar. You know, if we see a, re- a mass repatriation of those greenbacks, well, you see, that's the problem. You have China's holding what? Oh, about 1.5 trillion of them. How do they? But how do they turn them in? Well, they buy up businesses. Yeah, they they're going around the world right now buying up commodities and precious metals related anything with substance to recycle away those dollars. And that's what they're trying to do, and that's why one of the stories in the, in the uh, Winter Trends Journal was Chinatown, top trend for 20, thir- 2014. And they're buying up the world. And now you're looking at the United States, by the way, now trying to make a push into Africa because China's in there so deeply and keeps getting in deeper. And so the United States is now using this Nigeria incident as a reason, and AFRICOM, C-O-M, which should be AFRICON, it's the United States military now expanding bases in Africa. So, and then when I was talking about Libya before, let us not forget that there were over 30,000 Chinese working in the oil industry in Libya before President Obama, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, launched his, quote, humanitarian mission. So there's threats of China becoming more and more of a global economic power as the United States does the business of war, China is in the business of business. Gerald, as we wrap up here, uh, there are just so many pertinent topics today in the Trends Journal. Share whatever you see as uh, you know most relevant for our listening audience, uh, maybe any other uh, socioeconomic trends that you'd like to leave today with the audience. One is stay tuned what's going on in Ukraine. And there's no one I respect more geopolitically and economics is then Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, who was the former Assistant Treasury Secretary under Ronald Reagan. He's also a contributor to the Trends Journal. And I would suggest that anyone that wants to know the story of Ukraine, go to paulcraigroberts.org, as well as subscribing to the Trends Journal. Because all we're getting now is propaganda about Ukraine. There's a civil war going on. It's not going to have a happy ending. And it's destabilizing the region beyond just the Eastern European region. You already have a volatile situation economically in Europe. You don't need more destabilization. So I fear that this could spread out of control. And again, we have the timelines and how the propaganda has set it up to make this look like it was a Russian deal when, in fact, It was done by America. And the the videos are all there of our Assistant Secretary of State, Victoria Nuland, on December 13, 2013, at the National Press Club, talking about how Ukraine has to follow the path of the IMF and that they're Europeans. And she has a sign right behind her, sponsored by Chevron, and then put the pieces together. Just a week ago or so, we heard that our Hunter Biden, that's Vice President Biden's son, has been appointed to the largest energy company in Ukraine, Burisma Energy, B-U-R-I-S-M-A, along with Secretary of State John Kerry's stepson, Christopher Hines' business partner, Devon Archer, also appointed to Burisma Energy. So this thing is spinning out of control, and the bottom line, again, it looks like more dirty dealing on the level of how could I make a buck. Well, you've heard the saying, follow the money. It sounds like follow the oil money. Follow the oil money, and it's, and it's dripping right down into the White House. There should be outrage 
Instead, the State Department says these are private citizens and they're highly qualified for these positions. So I figured out, sure, out of 7 billion people on Earth, Biden and, and uh, Kerry's son-in-law's uh, stepson's partner are the most qualified people out of 7 billion to be on Burisma's Energy's board of directors. We always appreciate your thoughts here. It's cutting edge stuff. It's the trends before the trends journal. History before it happens. And we're going to look forward to having you back on the show. Thank you. And the website's trendsjournal.com. 